It's one of the most brutal murders that I've seen. Taj had four bullet holes in the back of his head. That's a vicious act. He was beat. You got him naked? Tied to a chair. Yeah, he was tortured and, I mean, he was real bad. That's the one thing that gets me about this case in general, is this guy ran terrified to his death. Somebody on that street saw something. It's been four years, nobody has said anything. This was the last known place that my daughter was seen. Keisha Jacobs, she was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance. There has been a person of interest in this case. He was convicted of a, another crime in that house, strangulation of a woman. The girl was tied to this bed. The red flags have got to be going up all over the place. Abduction. This is a guy. I would say he is a predator. I believe he gave her to someone. I believe my daughter's out there somewhere. Vinny Ferriello was found hanging inside his exotic pet shop in Chester. No one knows what happened. How can you say suicide and refute what the medical examiner is saying and they say it's a homicide? Some people think that he um, killed himself. It's just crazy to me because he just loved his family so much. Faith first reached out to me. She was 16 years old. And when she turned 20, she hit me up again. She said, Mr. Burkett, what can we do to reopen my dad's case? It doesn't add up to me, and it never has. My dad deserves justice. All I want is for my baby to come home. He was a wonderful father. And it's sad that my grandson only got two years with his father. I was his only, his only daughter. And he loved us more than anything in the entire world. I just miss my dad. There are thousands of cold cases in Virginia, and only 1% ever get solved. I just want some answers. I just want to know what happened to my son. I really miss him so much. He was a child, and he was a baby. I don't want to die not knowing what happened to my brother. We're wondering, still wondering, where is she, whether she's dead or alive. Only thing we want is justice, and that's all I can say. Nationwide, 240,000 unsolved murders. Virginia accounts for more than 5,000 of those cases. Cold case detectives like Johnny Capicelli spend countless hours reviewing interviews and old evidence, all in an effort to heat things up bring closure to victims' families. I think we have an obligation to, to victims and the family of victims to do everything possible as technology, investigative science evolves, uh, to bring those tools to bear to address those investigations and see if we can't get closure for those people. In my opinion, the success rate is, is kind of correlated to how the individual jurisdictions work these cases. In Chesterfield County, where Detective Capicelli served for nearly three decades, he spent more than 26 years in different facets of investigation work, a dozen years in cold cases. He has a passion to find the perpetrators of violence. How we built our unit from scratch, all of them felt that that was the model, if you will, for how cold cases should be worked. And when I say that, I mean allowing the team to really dive into the cases without the distraction, allowing the resources to come forward, and just as important, having a prosecutor there along the way from beginning to end. Capicelli says that model is why Chesterfield has had major successes in no-body cases. April 5, 2012, Altria employee Layla Namaranian failed to show up for work. Her body has never been found, but her killer, Michael Edwards, was convicted. June 6, 2014, nurse Zuma Pabon also never showed up for her shift. Asking just for help <laughs> to just find her. About a week later, her car found 18 miles from her Midlothian home at a trailer park. Her body has never turned up. Her four-year-old telling investigators the father hugged mommy and she fell asleep was used in court to convict Pabon's husband, John Gibbs, for murder. He's currently appealing. It breaks my heart that this had to happen. Um, I'm glad he's not going to be able to do anything like that to anybody else. And Linda Lunsford, a Walmart employee that disappeared the day after Christmas in 1996. Her body never found. Her killer, John Howard, recently convicted. He spent decades on detectives' radar and prosecutors pulled the trigger on a jury trial that wrapped up at the end of August. First and foremost, I think we have to give credit to our community. Our community works with us. Uh, they cooperate, they share information, they trust us, and they come forward 
um, and we can't solve crimes without them. And we emphasize public safety in Chesterfield County. We don't make excuses for that. We don't apologize for that um, because we care about our community and we want to get justice for victims. you like the angel from heaven. You don't have to say anything to me, okay? You know I'm not quitting, right? Cold cases work. It's, it's just something that's always been close to my heart because you know, I, I sat in the room with the family in the very first one we did in Chesterfield County in uh, 2006, I believe, and I, I've never felt that amount of emotion in my life watching the family of our victims crying and telling us, thank you, thank you, thank you for never putting this away. So it was a pretty impactful moment in my career. People realize how tough it is to work on these cases and what you guys do. You know, this is that one shot for the family to, to find peace and closure about what's happened to a loved one. But she's looking at you to, to bring some closure to this thing. And I know a lot of parents are feeling the same thing that I'm feeling. There's a lot of parents out here who kids been gone longer than mine, and they don't have no information, they don't know nothing, and they just sitting back waiting. Um, I understand her frustration. She's human, she's a mother, she's lost her child. Uh, so. Naturally, as any parent would want, they would want something done. Especially for them parents who lost their babies and their babies ain't been found. And they don't know. They don't know if they're here, if they're not. Like, I can't only imagine what them parents is going through. All I want is for my baby to come home. And I don't know what happened. I just want some answers. These are the faces of loved ones who suffered some of the most violent crimes or disappeared without a trace. Their families are still waiting for answers. Our mission is to bring awareness to these cases to find out what happened. In this documentary, we'll focus on three, a daughter, a father, and a son. This was the last known place that my daughter was seen. Keisha Jacobs, she was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance. There has been a person of interest in this case. The red flags have got to be going up all over the place. The person of interest is, uh, I would probably say he is a predator. Our team at Wilton Construction Fire and Water Services really feel for all the families in need of closure. Let's help solve the cold cases that plague our community. Please send tips to tips at reopenthecase.org. Candace, neighbors say police searched this park yesterday afternoon. This is an area close to where 21-year-old Keisha Jacobs uh, was last seen. A woman who is close to her family, and they haven't heard from her in more than 10 days. I'd have had, like so many people coming to me, Ms. Jacobs, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be able to make it through my situation. I look at you, you inspire me. I was like, Y'all just don't know what goes on behind my doors. The days I cry, the days that I can't get out, I don't wanna get up out of bed, but there's always something in the back of my head be like, you gotta get up. And if Quiche, if you can hear me, I love you with all my heart and soul. And mommy misses you, and I'm never giving up, baby. Um, Quiche was dropped off here by one of her friends about September the 26th. Keisha Jacobs, she was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance. I specifically remember mom telling me that uh, her daughter would not run away, uh, even though police had said, well, she's an adult, she can go and come as she pleases. Mom was, was adamant about, this is not my daughter. My daughter and I communicate, even if, even if we have a rough patch or an argument, we still communicate. So she was very worried about her daughter and thought something had happened to her. So Wednesday came, that evening, I'm sitting in my living room with my son and a couple of my friends, and I get a knock on the door, it's Quiche friends. Um, the guy, Demarcus, who dropped her off at the house. On, and, bro on Broad. On Broad Street. And a couple other friends. So I'd say it was like five or six of them. Then they proceeded to tell me that, hey, um, we went to the house that we dropped Quiche off at. And the guy said that he didn't, she wasn't there. I was like, so you did what? What house is this? So I was very upset and was like, take me to this house. So I made them show me exactly where this house was, um, which was like maybe a few hours after they had already been to this home. So I was furious because 
that God could have had any enough time to do anything he wanted to do with my daughter by the time we got here. The initial detective on the case was Detective Billy Thompson at RPD until he retired about a year ago. Right now, they're kind of taking a two-pronged approach. You have a homicide detective assigned to it and a missing persons detective assigned to it. The missing persons detective is uh, Clarence Key, and the homicide detective assigned is Anthony Coates. How important is this house in this investigation? Well, the house was very important because this is where she was at. She was dropped off here. We know she was inside, so uh, it was very, very important. Um, a lot of evidence was recovered inside and outside, so. That's where we're at. That's where we're at, yeah. The person that was here answered the door and he said, yeah, he knew Quiche, but he knew Quiche through one of her friends. Um, he said he saw her, first he said it was at five o'clock, um, I told him that wasn't right. Then he changed it to 5.30, and then he changed it to 6. And then I proceeded to call the police to let them know that his story wasn't adding up, and this was the last known place that my daughter was seen. Um, the police arrived, and but he had called another detective here to the scene as well. So he allowed the other detective to walk through the house instead of the police that I called. Do you know what detective may have gone through and and cleared it, or is that a, a, a false rumor that's going around? I don't know, since it's an ongoing you know, case, and we can't really speak on that detective that was involved in that. The person of interest in this case did, in fact, call a Richmond detective to the house in Church Hill. It was someone he knew personally that detective did go through the house before others. We've since learned the name of that detective. We're not gonna name him here, but I can tell you my sources say that he is on unpaid leave due to code of conduct issues. However, it's not related to this case. After about a year of doing stories on Quiche's disappearance, I learned of a person of interest name. We were reluctant to report it at the time because RPD asked us not to, but now five years into this thing, almost six years, his name is Otis Tucker, um, that he went by Omar. But yeah, his name was Otis Tucker. I just recently found out he was in Florida. My most concern at this point is him doing it to somebody else, or by the time the Commonwealth attorney decide to press charges or do what they need to do, he's gonna run. And it's gonna prolong the process when they should have locked him up or kept him in jail when they have. Otis has been questioned by the police, but not officially charged for the disappearance of Quiche Jacobs. He is also convicted of a crime in that house of strangulation of a woman and also bodily harm. He was accused of rape, but that charge was dropped due to a plea deal. If you can, tell me about, there was another person this guy was arrested for and ended, ended up serving time for. Yes, there was an incident that, uh that was found out during the investigation of this case. And the, the person of interest is, a, I would probably say he is a predator. So. The woman in that case actually talked to one of our producers via Facebook Messenger. Here's what she said. But this is what's crazy. After he attacked me and we fist fought until he got me locked down into a position that I couldn't stop him from strangling me. And when I woke up, I was tied up. But about 30 minutes later, Quiche showed up but he sent her away. She also said to our producer, the only way I even got away was because I let him drug me with Rimron, a psych medicine, but I have a tolerance, so it took two hours. He untied me after drugging me. I got up, got dressed like it was nothing, and he let me leave. We were in Churchill on the front sidewalk in front of the house where Quiche was last seen. We were interviewing the new detectives on the case when the homeowner, Karen G, came up and asked what we were doing. And when we told her, because she has a similar story in her family of a missing person that was found dead, she offered to let us inside. Let's get you out of this rain.
people knowing that that was the last place Quiche was at and walking into the house, definitely a sense of negative energy in the house. Uh, you know, when you walked in the, the main area, I remember the red carpet, maroon carpet that was out front. Once you go out the back door, it's a basement that's off the, on the back porch. It leads down some steps. It's like underground, under the house pretty much. I found that out. Um, and first, my first instinct was like, oh, this man could have had Quiche down this basement the whole time when the police came to look or when that detective walked through the house and nobody would ever heard him because it is so far out of the house. It's like no. nobody would have known she was there. We used to have to come down here just to dry clothes. So you know, I used to be like, ah, I hate to go. I used to hate to come down here. It was full with cobwebs. It still had junk from uh, back in the day in there, it had an old tube TV there, and uh, it just kind of gave you an eerie feeling. When you come down, man, and you just, you know, you got the case, is this the first time down in the basement? When you see something like, does it kind of help you put things into perspective for the investigation? Well, it does. It helps you when you actually see the scene instead of looking at the photographs. Upstairs was the bedroom where the person of interest was staying. Wow. Which was his room? Down there. Down. I don't know if they've since turned the HVAC unit off, but uh, it was really hot. So is this the bed that she was alleged to be tied to? Mm-hmm. They tell you grandma was staying downstairs, but hard of hearing. You can almost see that, yeah, it, see that. it'd be tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be mm -hmm. tough to find, you know, for her to hear something. If she only can read lips, she's that deaf. Right, so she's not gonna know she's what's, not going know what's going on upstairs. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah. And according to the homeowner, it's pretty much almost the same way it was when Quiche disappeared minus a few furniture items. Has police shared any evidence whatsoever from that case that we know? They haven't shared much as far as evidence. We have learned through the years some of the stuff they've collected, but they've asked us not to leak it out there because obviously it could it could ruin their case. Like I drove by three days straight and forensics was there. So and that's what I do remember of the case, that you go up there and the forensics van was parked out front and they were doing their thing. This is the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. I just want my baby to come home and if you see anything or think you've seen her, please call so she can come home and she can be okay. No more, no more. To me, I feel like the proper stuff with the police department wasn't done from the beginning when I reported Quiche missing because it took them a whole week before that they even took any interest or tried to do anything with Quiche's case. A lot of people in the community come forward, not only in Richmond, but throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. We've had sightings as far as Victoria, Virginia, Dinwiddie, Nottaway, and folks are calling us immediately after they're seeing the uh, um, news coverage on the uh, news from the 28th on. So we just ask that people continue to call us, give us those tips, let us track down those leads, and we just thank you so much for all you're doing. Breaking news about the disappearance of Quiche Jacobs. Richmond police say after 14 months of intense investigation, they believe foul play is involved. Uh, in the years past, I've grown to know Tony, uh, Quiche's mom. Uh, this woman has been through a lot. I remember when this first started happening and Tony would tell me about the mysterious Facebook and social media messages she would get. People put Quiche's face on a um, Muslim girl and say the Muslims have her. I had people call me playing on the phone saying, Mom, Mom, come get me. I had people calling me, telling me if I pay them a certain amount of money, they could find my daughter for me. People just being so cruel at first, it was like heartbreaking because I was going to wherever I could and thinking like I'm supposed to do everything and go everywhere that people tell me they saw her. 
But then I realized a lot of it was people playing, being playing cruel jokes on me. She needs closure. That's that's the bond. She needs closure for this one. And uh, I think both me and Detective Key and Detective Thompson, we all feel the same way that that we really like to close this out for. Basically, the bottom line is that you, you could put a case together, but we put the case together, Commonwealth Attorney prosecutes the case. So it's just a matter of what they feel that they could do with the case, so. I know he gave the information to the Commonwealth Attorney and the Commonwealth Attorney and had it since April. I've been calling and I've been calling and I've been calling and they keep telling me this is a process. What kind of process do you need? It's going on six years. September 26th will be six years. You know, Keisha disappeared in September of 2016. Her son was murdered at the Motel 6 on Midlothian Turnpike months later. I'll never get to tell my son I love him again. And I'll never get to hear it again. And I'm just praying Keisha comes home so I can tell her I love her. The guy that was serving time for her son's death, the, the killer in her son's case, is already out and about. He's already served his time and he's out. I think the information flow in this case is sort of like a faucet and it's starting to drip. And we're starting to see more and more information with the access that we've been given. So hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to come to Ms. Jacobs and say, hey, we think we can help you solve this thing. Vinny Ferriello was found hanging inside his exotic pet shop in Chester. No one knows what happened. How can you say suicide and refute what the medical examiner is saying and they say it's a homicide? Some people think that he um, killed himself is just crazy to me because he just loved his family so much. This this is, I don't know what's happening in this picture, but that's my dad. That's silly, goofy Vinny, the goofiest guy you'd probably ever meet. That stance says it all, <laughs> you know? Life of the party always, made everything a game. Everywhere we went, everything was fun. There wasn't a time when nothing, we went out with dad, like you had a good time. He's the reason I, I, I do things that scare me. I was painfully shy growing up. He always wanted me to do things like, you know, step out of my comfort zone. And I was really lucky to have um, 11 years with him. Vinny Ferriello, January 3rd, 2014, was found hanging inside his exotic pet shop in Chester. I wanna say it's probably around noon, maybe 11.30 in the morning. And by one o'clock, I start my shift at 2.30, by one o'clock I was already in. Uh, Vinny Ferriello was a science teacher at Thomas Dale. He's well known in the area. He's always known as the reptile guy. Say hello to my little friend. Vinny had swagger within the community. I mean, the kids loved him at Thomas Dale. Kids that came into his store loved him because he was very active with the snakes. We let him pet the snakes and uh, just a really fun, a uh, kind-spirited guy to be around. I was 11 years old. My mom came home and like soon followed everybody else in my family. And it br brought us all into the like the living room. And we just knew like right away something was really off. And my mom grabbed my hands and knelt down in front of me and she said, all she said was, um, daddy died. I just, um, I just kind of like froze and um, and I didn't even know, I didn't even know how to react actually. I just kind of went upstairs and cried in my room. And I didn't really want anyone to follow me. But I just needed to be alone because I didn't know. I didn't know what to do with myself. It was big news in this town. Hearing later, a couple days later, that suicide could possibly be it, kids would gather and say, there ain't no way. Uh, you know, this, this guy would never do that to his family. Well, I knew he was a family man. He talked about his kids and being a teacher. I just couldn't see him committing suicide. It just did not sound right. I didn't know for like two years after we found out that he died what happened. I, I Googled it, actually, and, um, and that's how I found out. I just saw everything that had been on like websites about it and everything. Faith first reached out to me, she was 16 years old, and she reached out to me via Facebook Messenger. 
And I said, Faith, I'd love to help you, but you need to be an adult. You need to get your mom's blessing. And when she turned 20, she hit me up again. She said, Mr. Burkett, what can we do to reopen my dad's case? And that's kind of how the, the balls got rolling on this. It's hard to forget Bill and Stephanie, the scene that played out here about six months ago in this parking lot. This place was packed. We have also obtained a copy of Vinnie Ferriello's death certificate. The medical examiner confirms his manner of death was homicide. I was shocked, you know, to see that in writing, you know, and but I'm kind of upset that this wasn't noticed before. You know, it takes six months to finally for this stuff to come out. This blood on the sink, the microwave, the back room, you know, in all different places, the ground, the floor, the countertop, everywhere there was blood, so. From my knowledge, they didn't do anything, like they didn't clean up the blood afterwards, they didn't, they didn't test the DNA, they didn't do any of that. The only thing I know about where he was is he was in the back, the, the door, front doors, taped off, but he was in a back room, almost like a, there's like an office space in the back. That's where he was, right there at that doorway. Like it was just such an abnormal thing for him to do, park out front of the store, because he never did that. He, everyone, you know, worked with him, knew him, like he always parked in the back of the store. Well, there's several theories floating out there. It's just a matter of which one is the right one. You know, I've heard a theory of organized crime. The, the devil is in the details we don't know yet. So far, police have not officially reopened this case. He would still be here if it wasn't for whoever or whatever happened to him, whoever took him from us and, and uprooted our lives, and, and that he would he would still be oh, my best friend. And I just yeah, I just miss my dad. I um, you know walking down the aisle is a big one. Um, cause it's like, you know, he would want to do that. It was his only, his only daughter, his little girl, call me Bunny. And, um, and the fact that he's not going to be able to walk me down the aisle or if I have kids and is that he's just not here and he, he didn't get to be here cause someone didn't give him the chance. And he loved this more than anything in the entire world. I just know. I just know more than anything he would want. He would want to be here for all this for me, my family, my brothers, my mom. This is probably one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. But um, but I, I'm doing it for my dad. And this is one thing that mom brought up. She feels like the answer is on Facebook. She says that that's the way he communicated. He communicated through Facebook Messenger. She believes that he may have chatted with his killer. And Taj was your only son? Yes, Taj was my only boy. He was lovable. He was lovable. He had the most beautiful smile. I heard from multiple people that he's a wonderful father. He to was a wonderful father. He just said he wanted to be there for his son. He wanted to be a good father. I'm so tired of people playing God and just running around here taking people's lives. Like, it's, it's sickening. There's no reason that he should have been done like that. I'm on scene same thing right here. He, I'm pretty sure he's dead. We're going to need MCU for this. So Taj was last seen May 2nd of 2018. It's around 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And Taj's girlfriend saw him leave the house, the home that they shared on McKenzie Street. Around 6 or 7 o'clock at night, several gunshots were heard. Taj's body was found on a porch uh, the next morning around 8.30. Cherie, first I want you to take me back to the day you learned of your son's passing. That whole entire day, I felt sick to my stomach. And then the detectives called about 3.45 and asked me, was he my son? And then they said to wait, that they were gonna, they needed to come and speak to me. And then they came to my job and sat me in a room and showed me a picture on the phone and asked me, was that my son? What was the picture of? Was it him on that front porch? Yes. 
We start with breaking news out of Petersburg, where police have just released the name of the city's latest homicide victim. Crime insider sources say it was 22-year-old Tajmir Hopkins, who was found naked on the front porch of a home by a neighbor. And we are told that he had been shot multiple times and was bound, beaten, and gagged. Had literally some type of literature, white sheet or rag or some type. I don't know how it was around his neck. It's been four years. Nobody has said anything. Even after you heard gunshots. When you know it's in the clear, at least you come outside and you look around to see, you know. So for you to just not come outside at all and look around and, cause you can, if you live right across the street, I'm sure you can, you could have seen his body. So I don't understand how nobody saw nothing. I just I don't understand that. And then that chair is still on the porch. And I don't understand that either. Out of all of his injuries, which one stuck out to say this was personal? Because it, it was very personal. The fact that they tied him up, the fact that you, you got him tied around the neck, like you up close, you, you got him naked. The way that his wounds were, they're very close, personal wounds to his face. He was shot four times in the head, according to the autopsy. He was bound, he was gagged. He was bloody, um, face was swollen. It appears that uh, a message was, was trying to be sent, yes. He suffered. We were able to get documents from the courts in Chesterfield County, and it did show some sort of a beef between Taj and a man that was known to the family. So this is the last complaint that Taj Mir had against That's your son's handwriting, right? Mm-hmm. He just was evil. I, I'm not, listen, if I was to find out that he was the one who did something to my son, I wouldn't be surprised. What we're doing here, what do you hope comes about? They need to get on their job. They need to get into his Facebook. Two days after he was murdered, his Facebook was shut down. It was deactivated. They could find out who he met up with, who he was talking now, to. Can you get in with a search warrant? They said they can't get into it. Here's where mom believes Taj was before he was supposed to go play basketball. Uh, Taj was with the girlfriend and then he went to a friend's house. So he messaged her from Facebook and said that he was at some boy's house and it was a couple of guys there and it didn't seem right. So he was supposed to have left from there and was going to VSU to play basketball. As far as you know, what have you guys been able to determine where Mr. Hopkins was prior to this location? Uh, through the course of our investigation, we found out that Mr. Hopkins went to Virginia State University on campus and played basketball with some folks, uh, friends of his. After he finished his game, his whereabouts became unknown. Did he walk back here or did someone drop him off? I don't have any information on his method of travel at a particular time. You've been in law enforcement a long time. 32 you know years. You know your stuff. Travis Christian is the new chief of police down there, so there's a lot of changes. Uh, Kenneth Miller was the chief at the time. Uh, Travis was a deputy chief. He is now chief, and he has reassigned other detectives to this case now. The way that he was killed, I, and it was a large crime scene if I remember, because I remember the day I went to the house. Uh, where he was almost running a block down the street. Correct. So folks along that street had to have heard it, had to have seen something. You know, one thing I, I, I do know about uh, in, in law enforcement, as you said, people see things, people hear things. If you have gunshots going off in a neighborhood, somebody's going to be paying attention. Somebody's going to look. About six, seven shots, man, about right before it dark, or may have been dark. I didn't pay attention, but I paid attention to those shots. That scene was not just isolated to that porch. That was a, that was a scene that stretched a block or so and then ended on a porch. So that we, we're confident that someone knew something, seen something, heard something. But as always, the challenge is getting folks to come forward and share that information. And this is one thing that mom brought up. She feels like the answer is on Facebook. She says that that's the way he communicated. He communicated through Facebook Messenger. She believes that he may have chatted with his killer. What have you instructed your guys to do as far as weeks to months to heat this thing up? Well, um, putting another detective on it, um, one, we're going to re-examine again all the evidence that was collected. He was uh, tied to this metal chair 
This chair was overturned here on the porch and he was laying here. The chair is still on the porch. And I don't understand. Because I'm sure it's evidence on that. She doesn't believe detectives took all the evidence they could have. For instance, that chair is still there. Like it wasn't picked up. The evidence wasn't picked up. And she said there could have been fingerprints or something on that. You know how scenes are processed. Normally everything that's around the body is taken. Why do you think they left such a, a high profile thing like, this, for instance, the chair? Well, I'm not aware of the, all the evidence uh, that was collected from the scene. I do know that there was a lot of evidence taken. Um, go back and canvas the area. Go back and canvas the area, not only for additional evidence, but for additional people that may have been around or heard something. And hopefully we can kind of uh, turn over a stone that somebody, someone may have missed. I've known Travis Christian, the chief of police in, in Petersburg, for more than 20 years. And I think that he will do his due diligence to make sure we get a rap on this thing and, and somebody gets arrested. Um, but it, again, it all comes down to the folks out there that were, that were close to Taj, the people that live on that street, what are they willing to tell to make this thing open up and, and thaw out? That's the big question, because there are people on that street, St. Matthews, that have the answers. How deep does this go? Because people, for people to be that scared, to me, it has to be deeper than that. I just don't feel like he has peace. It's like this thing happened to him and it's, it's not solved. Like I know what's happening to y'all family. Somebody needs to start talking. And it's sad that my grandson only got two years with his father because he was, he was a good father. We first started working on the Tajmir Hopkins case back in April of this year. Let's check in with mom and see if there's been any progress. I feel like the only reason why I'm probably in a good place now is because reopen the case have stepped in. So that has given me more hope than what I've had this whole entire time. But I did have a chance to speak to the DA and we went over, you know, some concerns that I may have had. Our producer got a call from Detective Royster in August. He was making arrangements for Petersburg's forensic team to pick up the now infamous chair. And on Monday, September 12th, they came by CBS 6 and retrieved that chair. So I take into consideration that I know that there is a lot of stuff going on. I know that there's a lot of deaths in Petersburg and, you know, I know they got other cases going on and I already know they short stabbed. The least you can do is reach out every once in a while. Make sure, you know, I know or the family know that we're still working on this case. This case ain't pushed to the back. It's frustrating that you have to, as a parent who lost a child, have to put in consideration of the department, but the department is not considering you. So that is just a messed up feeling. It hurts. It really hurts. It hurts all of us. We recognize that once a loved one is tragically killed in an incident, that after the news story is over, a family is still living with that loss. And our commitment is to make sure that in every case possible, we can find closure uh, for the family and bring justice to the person who's victimized someone that we're responsible for protecting. Even to the bad guys, it's a message. It's a message that, you know, while they think that they may have gotten away with it, there's still eyes out there looking into this case and it will come in for. There has to be a, a contribution, not just from the police, but from the community members. So something like the Reopen the Case Foundation is, is so instrumental in opening a door. And let's make sure that we understand that we're doing this to come together for the victims and the families of our victims. I think Tajmir case is gonna open up doors to a lot of cases. And, and if this is why he died to solve a lot, then that's what I'm here for, to give his life purpose. If you have information about the deaths of Tajmir Hopkins or Vinnie Ferriello, or the disappearance of Keisha Jacobs, call 833-RTCFNBA or email us at tips at reopenthecase.org.